Hello. Welcome and welcome back to the Magnus. It's really a pleasure to see all of you here today. Who knew? Of course we knew. But uh, noon on a Monday, it's really a delight to see so many friendly faces. Uh, we're in for a treat. Karen Underhill, University of Illinois at Chicago, Sharon Bernstein from the Bay Area, um, are presenting around a, well, it's a great story, so I'm letting Karen tell the story, uh, but are presenting around a manuscript that was found that, uh, as we like to do in our field of cultural uh, studies and, and cultural heritage, manuscripts that sometimes set off on a different course in its history that we think is uh, already known. And uh, you'll, you'll hear about dealings and, uh, and alternate endings to, to Sholem Aleichem's great story, Stempenu, as a scholar of Jewish music, one of my favorite stories, a story that tells of Chris Morin and gives a very direct depiction of Chris Morin. We knew how they were, you know, like these figures that sort of were in a crossover between rabbis and, and low lives. Uh, and, and spoke accordingly, had their own language, their own Kuzmer lotion, right? And so we hear this, and we hear the story of how Karen found this manuscript in a used bookstore in Chicago, and her ideas of why it ended there, and also the story of how Sholem Aleichem tried to adapt this uh, novella to the stage, didn't really succeed in having it produced, but in a way he did, because it's here today in Berkeley, and, um, and Sharon Bernstein is completing the, the picture by going through the musical material, songs, sometimes written out, other times just uh, sort of sketched. It was, it, was a, it was a proof of concept. It was not a fully producible uh, play. So uh, uh, Sharon Bernstein also composed new music that fits in with the style of the materials that are there. A wide range of musical materials from uh, different types of Yiddish song to cantorial music to batchones, the, 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 the the free rhymes that wedding jesters would improvise to entertain the bride, or in this case, to let the bride sit down and take stock of the fact that her life is just ended. <laughs> um, all of this, I would say, thanks to a fantastic, phenomenal partner, friend of the Magnus, Shayna Penn, Toby Philanthropies, who actually also had the genius of creating the duo, the dynamic duo that's about to perform uh, today. Uh, I was able to get uh, uh, a sense of the rehearsals and it's, it's really fantastic materials that we're presenting fresh anew. So without any further ado, thank you to everybody who contributed to making this program possible. Thank you to all of you for coming today and welcome Karen Underhill and Sean Bernstein to the mic. Thank you, Francesco, and um, a huge thanks to you and to Shana Penn of the Taube Foundation for the invitation to put together this program for the Magnus and the opportunity to introduce a lost piece of Yiddish liter literary and theatrical history to your community. It's amazing to see all of you here today. Actually, on a Monday at noon, I'm just, I'm really excited that you decided to come out. I also want to extend thanks um, on both my and Sharon's behalf to Lisa Davis of the Magnus Museum for her help in organizing this event, and to a number of our colleagues and friends who have helped both me and Sharon in working with the Yiddish text and the Yiddish song lyrics, including Yale Haver, Rick Meller, and Michael Wex. As a graduate student at the University of Chicago in Polish Jewish studies, I discovered among an assortment of Yiddish language manuscripts and newspaper clippings in a used bookstore near the campus, a handwritten manuscript by the Yiddish writer Sholem Aleichem Solomon Rabinowitz. The pen name Sholem Aleichem um, actually means how do you do. Author of the Tevye stories and one of the fathers along with Mendel Mokris Forum and Yud Laman Peretz of modern Yiddish literature. My research into this beautiful document, including at the Ivo Institute for Jewish Research in New York, revealed that this previously unknown and untranslated manuscript is the original 1905 dramatization by Sholem Aleichem and written in his own hand of his own first novella, Stempenu, the story of a love between the great klezmer, fiddle player, Stempenu, and the beautiful and very married Rochel. In Sholem's dramatization, the story of Stempenu and Rochel uh, is brought to stage and life with music, and through music, that of Stempenu and his band of klezmorim, or klezmer musicians, but also songs 
from the rhymes of the wedding badkan in the opening act, through well-known folk tunes, nigunim, hummed in the home, prayers sung at the Shabbos table, to wistful songs of longing, sung by the play's real protagonist, the young Rahul. For this reason, the centrality of music to the script of Stempanyu that I found, I was especially delighted and honored that Sharon Bernstein took an interest in the project and offered to work with me on this program and to bring to life actually for the very first time the musical pieces that uh, form an integral part of this manuscript and of Sholem Aleichem's conception of the drama. It has been a joy and an, uh, an amazing experience to work with you, Sharon. At the time that I found this Stempanyu manuscript, I had been living in Krakow, Poland, and running a bookstore for many years, in addition to being a graduate student, and was deeply involved in the Jewish revival there. The complex process of recovery and of and reconnection with the pre-war Jewish past in Poland that was taking place both in that country and among visitors returning to Poland to learn about the Jewish past. Based on this experience of engaging with Jewish places in Poland, and the lines of access, the portals that they open up to the Jewish past, I would like to suggest that we may also treat the material artifact, the surviving object, filled with its peculiar aura of authenticity, as a place, as both a textual and a material space of encounter and transmission, a site of memory. As David Roskies has suggested in A Lieu de Memoir, within diasporic, deterritorialized Yiddish land, on the other hand, because of its specific fate within the Pravatiner family in whose former home this manuscript was left behind, we might do better to treat the manuscript as a kind of non lieu de memoir, a potential site of memory that had been forgotten, suppressed, and pressed out of family narratives as a result of assimilation, of changing emphases within Jewish education and within communal narratives of Jewish identity that developed in post-World War II Jewish communities in the US. And finally, using a, rhetoric dis a, a theoretical discourse drawn from memory studies and post-colonial studies, one which I also use in my work with Polish Jewish spaces, we may also speak of such a manuscript as a ghostly or spectral object, invoking connotations of both inheritance and responsibility, with which Jacques Derrida's language of spectrality and Gayatri Spivak's concept of the ghost dance are associated. In Spivak's language, I quote, the ghost is not only a revenant, a returner, also French for ghost, but also an arrivant, one who arrives, because it coordinates the future in the past. This theoretical line has led me to ask, how and why can the encounter with an artifact that reaches across the divide of the Holocaust, that jumps forward from a time when Yiddish culture was vital in Poland and Russia and full of new hope, influence the ways that we think about the future or build the future. For example, how might a study of that moment encapsulated in this material object influence our conceptions about the role that the Yiddish language and Yiddish culture can and should play in our future? Appropriately, it was just that one word, Yiddish, used like an accidental charm at the right time and in the right place that opened a door and produced the manuscript. My initial intention in invoking this word, Yiddish, was actually to ward off the advances of the bookseller, who was trying to invite me into his bookshop. <laughs> On a graduate student budget, and afraid of being drawn in by the irresistible antique books at this shop that I've known and loved since childhood, I grew up in Hyde Park, I was hanging out by the door while a friend of mine looked around. The owner, Doug Wilson, of O'Gara and Wilson Books, very kindly asked, maybe there's something here that you could be interested in. And I wanted to be polite, but also to get off the hook. And I told him, um, I'm only interested in Yiddish language texts from Eastern Europe. I thought that I would finish the conversation there. Hmm, Yiddish, he said. Actually, I have five grocery bags of papers and manuscripts sitting in the back that are apparently in Yiddish and Russian. Needless to say, it makes me nervous now just remembering. I abandoned my plans of escape and spent the next three days helping him to identify and organize the materials. They were bags that he had retrieved from a trunk in the basement of a house in the South Shore neighborhood, just south of the University of Chicago, that had gone into foreclosure and had to be emptied out. Called to clear out a huge collection of books, he noticed the papers before leaving in a trunk and loaded them up. They were fascinating and included newspaper clippings, arbiter ring teaching materials, 
books for, uh, of plays for children, and saved copies of magazines and literary journals. The Sholem Alecha manuscript, however, stood out from among the other documents. It bears a cardboard cover decorated with the title and author's name in colored pencil and pointillist decorative lettering. Stempani, oder der Yiddische Paganini, a drama in fünf Akten von Shalom Alechem. 55 pages long, the manuscript is written in a clear, legible Yiddish on good quality lined Russian paper and carefully prepared with a number of finishing details that suggest that it was intended mm, for, um, as a finished and legally identified copy that could be delivered to a director or producer ready to be used for production. Like a published work, the title page includes uh, full, full identification of title and author in both Yiddish and Russian. There's the Russian. Uh, and is stamped by Sholem Alechem, uh, by Solomon Nachman Rabinovich, Sholem Alechem, with, uh, with a place and date of Kiev, August 1905. Interestingly, as an aside, the Russian spelling of the title also reads Stempani, Ili Evretsky Paganini. Uh, and not something you. Some of you might have noticed the disparity looking at your program. One of the aspects of the te text for which I have not yet found or heard a satisfactory explanation, um, is it dialectical? Is he making a choice to make it different from the novella? I would be very happy to hear your opinions on whether this is just an altered knit pronunciation or spelling, or an intentional name change. The manuscript contains uh, numbered page dividers between acts, page numbers, and scored musical pieces taped and folded into the manuscript where the songs appear throughout the play. The folk song Haskala, sung according to Sholem Alechem's stage, stage directions in Litvish by a Litvak woman, a version of Tekante Shabbos sung by Alik, a young in-law of Rochels, Vos mir seinen seinen mir, what we are, we are, sung by the full cast, and a setting of Ashamni, a prayer of confession of sins chanted on Yom Kippur, here sung by Rochel herself, Verses to several additional songs are also written into the manuscript for a total of 15 pieces running through all five acts. This would be a good time for a brief synopsis. For those who know the novella Stempanu, are there some here who, have, who are familiar with Stempanu? Okay, a few of you. Uh, originally published in 1888, um, the, the 1905 play manuscript follows the story quite closely, but shortens it substantially distilling it down to five short acts filled with musical pieces. Synopsis. The virtuoso klezmer violinist and lady slayer, Stempanu, already famous as the Jewish Paganini, spies Rochel at a wedding and, at, that he is playing and falls passionately in love with her on sight. Rochel, who is married and who lives in the house of her overbearing and protective in-laws, feels imprisoned, suffocated, and lonely in her marriage. Stempanu's music arouses her passions and her desire for freedom as well as her shame and her guilt at those feelings. Stepanu brazenly professes his love for Rochel. They are kindred artistic spirits, free spirits, he tells her, and they should run away together, escape their arranged marriages, kick off the dust of this old town and see the world, live for art and for love. The play explores Rochel's personal engagement with Jewish tradition through textual study and prayer, and highlights the friendship between two women, Rochel and Hai Etel, that remains the moral compass throughout the play. As in the novella, Rochel ultimately resists Stampanu's advances and remains home. In the final act, we find out that she has escaped, not with Stampanu, but with her own husband, from his parents' house to her parents' house <laughs> in a nearby town. Stampanu has also returned to his own spouse and his own kitchen. In short, nothing happens. No one dies, no one has sex out of wedlock, no one strikes it rich, and no one blows a fortune. No one marries a communist, a non-Jew, or even a poet. And no one makes it on the New York stage. Most importantly, neither Rachel nor Stempanu commit suicide. And this is where the manuscript gets interesting, and actually changes the way that Yiddish theater history, and even the stories scholars have told about Sholem Alechem, has been told. Why so? The fact that the Sholem that, that the Sholem the fact that Sholem Aleichem turned his novella into a play in 1905 is not new information. A play based on the novella Stempanu and entitled Die Yiddische Techter, The Jewish Daughters, 
was one of the two plays by Sholem Aleichem that opened in New York on the same day in 1907. Leading Yiddish theater producers Jacob Adler and Boris Tomaszewski competing to be the first theater and troupe to introduce Sholem Aleichem's work to American Jewish audiences staged simultaneous openings of the Yiddish Tector and Meyer Shalant, celebrating the great Yiddish writer's arrival in America. Sholem Aleichem ran back and forth that night between the two theaters. The Yiddish Tector, a dramatization of Stempenu, was the one staged by Boris Tomaszewski's theater, and it was almost universally panned by its critics. In fact, both plays closed after only a few weeks. Based on this history, the Stempenu interlude has been discussed by scholars up till now as an example of how very out of touch the most brilliant Yiddish writer was with American Jewish audiences. However, as the recovery of the 1909 manuscript helps to reveal, first, the play that Tomaszewski staged in 07 differs dramatically in content and structure from the musical version of the novella that Sholem Aleichem originally imagined and that he penned himself. Before we could see the 1905 manuscript, it was impossible to know to just what extent this was true and how Sholem Aleichem had originally imagined the drama. And second, with the 1905 original in front of us, we can also see that in fact, Sholem Aleichem wrote the play not to appeal to American audiences or to gain access to the American stage as had been previously assumed, but actually with East European, Russian, and Polish Jewish audiences in mind, and with the, attention, with the intention of allowing popular Jewish audiences in the Russian Empire, finally, to see and hear themselves on the art stages of the Russian Empire, where undoctored, un-Germanicized Yiddish had been officially banned since 1883. How can we see this? Inside the front board cover of the August 1905 manuscript is pasted and folded a copy of a contract, typed on a pre-revolutionary Russian typewriter, signed in Warsaw just over a month earlier, in late June of 1905. The parties to the contract are Literator, Solomon Rabinovich, Shalom Aleichem, uh, on the one side, and the team of producers, here called Artiste, Y.V. Spivakovsky, Yankil Spivakovsky, and S. Adler, Sam Adler, not Jacob Adler, on the other part. In the contract, the parties, I quote, in their desire to change the physiognomy, physiognomy of the Jewish theater according to literary and artistic requirements of our time, and to put in good order the business of Jewish-German and Yid Yiddish theater repertoire. It was referred to, it was allowed to be referred to only as Jewish-German theater repertoire until that time. Agree to cooperate on the production of dramatic works of high literary value throughout the Russian Empire. Essentially, to join forces in the creation of a, quote, yiddish literarisch Kunsttheater, based out of Odessa. Spivakovsky and Adler agreed to entrust the employee, Satrunika, and editor, Sholem Aleichem, with the task of composing repertoire and selecting plays, and Sholem Aleichem agrees to provide the directors with dramatizations of his own literary works for exclusive production within the Russian Empire by their theater troupe. He also commits himself to attend dress rehearsals and the first performances of each production and to serve as artistic advisor to ensure the quality of the productions. He receives an initial one year advance of 200 rubles to be deducted from his payments of the first 40 performances at five rubles apiece and he signs for a receipt of the money. <coughs> the terms of the contract and the contract itself were known to scholars. An executed copy, Sholem Malechem's executed copy of the same contract is held in the archives of Beit Sholem Malechem. And the author himself enthused about it in a letter to his daughter Missy of June 30th, 1905, sent from Warsaw. They have they have sich genommen mit mein Hilfen richtig wegzustellen die Sache von dem Nischen Theater. Euch zu bauen an ein jüdisch literarisch Kunsttheater. They have undertaken with my help to set right the entire matter of Yiddish theater, to establish a kind of Yiddish literary art theater. For the first season, I have agreed to prepare, and am still working on them now, two long and four one-act plays. And I have in my head another two or three long four and five-act plays. What was not clear earlier was that Stepanu was one of those plays. Apparently the first one written following the signing of the contract. Going back a little further, pre-contract, to January of 05, Sholem Aleichem had responded to the loosening of restrictions on Yiddish newspapers and theaters that happened in that year by publishing in Warsaw's Der Weg, a lengthy and rousting appeal to his fellow Yiddish writers. Mir, mir, Yiddish Schreiber, 
Folks, Schriftstelle. The time is nigh with the, uh, when the closed doors of Yiddish theater, of what we could call Yiddish folks theater, will be opened. The time is nigh when one will not hear German in the Yiddish theater, that very clever German that it turns one's stomach to hear. <laughs> the Yiddish language, the true folk language, the jargon, will take its place. And the Yiddish folk, the masses, when they discover that one can actually hear a Yiddish avort in the theater, will allow themselves to be draw drawn into the Yiddish theater. They will want to hear and see what one should see and hear in the theater. They will want to hear familiar words, well-known people, familiar faces, scenes and characters that reflect normal, everyday life, end quotes. In the same appeal, Shalom el sees himself as writing not only for the folk, but perhaps even more for the players. Players whose, quote, God-given burden it was, in his formulation, to ply their craft in Golis under the name of German-Jewish troops, who were like slaves that he would lead out from the Egypt of Shund, in which they had slaved for decades, quotes, wandering from city to city and playing such figures as Schmendrick, Kuni Lamel, Shaboisi, and others like them, end quotes. Still quoting, let the actors not have any complaint. Let them not offer the same excuse as the Jews in Egypt. They have given us no straw, and yet they tell us to make bricks. Instead of sharpening our tongues, pronouncing our ideas, pointing our faults, writing long critiques and papers about art, we would do better to set to work plays, Write plays, build a repertoire, a little repertoire, a young one, perhaps not yet so ripe, but something. Let us give something to our folks' theater. Stephen knew then with its musical structure, its diversity of dialects, songs and longings of young women, its insults and curses, bodkin rhymes and racy klezmer lotion, represented one of his initial attempts to put this new project into effect and to give the Jewish audiences things they had never seen before. As he wrote, They'll see butchers in the marketplace singing lively little feet. They'll see girls walking here and there in the streets singing, I want it, I want it, I want. <laughs> That's what they'll see. And they will hear things that no ears have, have heard on Mount Sinai. Wild thoughts, clumsy thoughts, uh, clumsy monologues, banal sayings, the songs of vodkins, tired old jokes, vulgar couplets, and plenty of foul language. <laughs> A lot more than in the worst circus, in the lowest brawl. That's what they'll hear. End quotes. <coughs> Written, as the contract and the stamp on the manuscript demonstrate, in July and August of 1905, the original Stempenu turns out to be a product not of Shalom Lechem's attempt to interest New York producers, which he would begin to do a few months later, only a few months later, but of the heady months of that year, 1905, between the January loosening of the official ban that had been placed on Yiddish language theater productions in 83, and the October 1905 pogroms following the outbreak of the revolution that would cause Sholem Aleichem to begin making urgent plans to move to America. Sholem Aleichem's 1905 idealistic project with Spivakovsky and Adler to create the Yiddish art theater did not come to fruition for more than one reason. According to one source, because a rival theater group denounced Spivakovsky and Adler's troupe as having revolutionary tendencies. In September of the same year, only a couple of weeks after he completed this manuscript, Sholem Lechem was back in Warsaw for the wildly successful opening of his play, Zeit und Zuspreit, where he met with a Dr. Fischberg, who was eager to help bring Sholem Lechem's play to Jacob Adler in New York. Within a month, as the correspondence shows, Sholem Lechem had sent him to New York versions of both Stempenu and Zeit und Zuspreit, retitled Meyer Schalant. Although it was a bit misleading in some respects, causing scholars to assume that Stephanie was written for that American audience, one thing that this exchange of letters between Sholem Lechem and Dr. Fishberg do contain are interesting clues as to the high opinion the author had about his own Stephanie script. In his October 8th letter, Sholem Lechem explains to Dr. Fishberg the, the two plays he has sent him for Adler's consideration. Again, Stephanie, Oda de Yusha Paganini, and Meyer Shalant. In this one, he writes of Meyer Chalant, there is more that is true to life than in the first one, meaning Stephanie, but also less of poetry than in Stephanie. Only two weeks later, we have another letter from him to Fishberg saying, I am sending you the fifth act of Stephanie, a new act instead of the earlier one, with a death as America demands. <laughs> a Jewish heroine, in my opinion, rarely poisons herself for love. But what can you do if America orders it? Show the fifth act to Mr. Adler. Let him look through the whole play carefully. Let him stage it once, down to its last detail, and he will see just what this is." End quotes. 
By the time he wrote the second of these letters, Sholem Aleichem had lived through the October pogroms in Kiev, staying holed up in a hotel room with his family. He was desperate to find the means to get them out of Kiev and, if possible, to America. On the one hand, this letter reveals the artistic compromises he was willing to make in hopes of helping his family and finding additional income. But it also reveals that he seems to have thought quite highly of his Stephanie dramatization and to have believed it would be recognized as a literary and theatrical achievement. So briefly, how does the original play differ from the one that flopped? First, I would argue that where the O5 version, like the novel, is a story of community, of the romantic artist who sings the song and expresses the soul of that community, and of a young female protagonist who represents that community's struggle to both to honor and to challenge tradition, the O7 American version, staged by Tomaszewski's troupe, splinters that shuttle community into unhappy individuals, all of whose dreams are dashed in the end. The text of the four-act De Yiddish Tector that was preserved in the archive of Madame Tomaszewski is a crasser and rowdier play, even violent, with dialogue and action that verges on vaudeville camp. Betrayal, jealousy, and death threats, Moisha Manashe's after he sees Rochel and Stempenu kissing. Suicide, Rochel's. And finally, madness, Stempenu's madness, after he drags his beloved's body from the river where she has drowned. Interestingly, Tomaszewski didn't have her poison herself, as in the second Americanized ending that Shulam Lechem had mentioned in his letter to Fishburg. Instead, she has thrown herself in the river. In Shulam Lechem's original version, as we'll see later, this method of suicide was used by the non-Jewish daughter of a Polish nobleman, also heartsick for Stempenu. But it appears as an example of exactly what a Jewish woman would be most unlikely to do, a kind of constitutive other in an Eastern European Jewish story of endurance. In some ways structured more like an opera or symphony than a play, the 1905 version treats the vi voices and characters of the community as individual instruments in a larger musical work. It reads like an attempt to bring the novel Stephanie to life, not only through music, but as music, in which Yiddish language and Jewish music become versions of one another, a dual embodiment of the author's key gesture, that of giving voice to the Jewish world on the Russian stage. Here, Stempenu slash Dash Paganini also stands in part for Sholem Aleichem, the romantic artist who produces or plays the virtuosic piece filled with the soul of the Jewish people. In addition to the actual folk songs, klezmer music, the sung rhymes of the Badkin, prayers and nigunim present in almost every scene, the dialogue itself is written so as to give the spoken language distinctly musical characteristics, including various forms of repetition and echoing recurring motifs or refrains, fading, alternation between soloist and chorus, and contrapuntal voices. Just to offer one example, the play opens in medias res at the wedding scene with a contrapuntal back and forth between the groom's side and the bride's side each side in unison echoing the other's flustered exclamations. This operatic back and forth uh, scenario that doesn't seem like it would work without background music goes on for a full 22 lines. Large sections of dialogue in some of the folk songs were retained in the 1907 staged version, but around them were added lengthy scenes of dialogue, which include spiteful and aggressive gossip, physical fighting, such as in the second act, when the Shabbos Tish devolves into all of Rachel's in-laws calling not only her but each other sluts, spitting on and slapping each other. Other less crass scenes that were added to the play are designed to mock the loathsome character of Menasha Mendel, Rachel's from husband who can neither satisfy her need to be loved nor pull her from the river when she throws herself in at the end. I've concluded that these new sections, which make up a good third to a half of the 1907 play, were not written by Sholem Lechem, but rather by Boris Tomaszewski. This version of events is actually described by Tomaszewski himself in two articles that appeared in the California Yiddish Stimme in 1929, an account that Zilbertzweig had dismissed in the lexicon of Yiddish theater as fantastical and self-aggrandizing. But in these articles, Tomaszewski relates how he bought the play Stampinu from Sholem Aleichem, and when the author lent him his copy, he hadn't read it for more than 15 minutes before he gave it back to him so he could make a play out of it. But even when Sholem Aleichem brought back the new work, 
quotes, I saw what he had, that he had done very little to the play. The characters are brilliant, the language Sholem Aleichem like, but stage the piece, you couldn't do it. Or he couldn't do it in the three weeks that he had. He continues, Stempenu was not ready to produce on the stage, but to let Adler stage Sholem Aleichem's first play in America, this I couldn't tolerate. I soon took it upon myself and began to improve the play. From my own comparison of the 1907 typescript with the original manuscript, I believe we can take this story at face value. The announcement for the play's opening in the, Yiddish, uh, in the uh, New York papers confirms this. Yiddish attacker oder Stempenu, a drama in vier Akten von Sholem Aleichem, zerniert und aufgeführt von B. Tomaszewski. So, uh, staged and dramatized by Tomaszewski. Thus, we have not yet seen any attempt, we have not yet seen any attempt to stage, stage or score verbally and instrumentally the play that Shulam Lechem hoped to bring to, to the stage uh, of the Yiddish Art Theater in Russia. Before looking more closely at the music of Stephanie, a question remains. Why did the manuscript find its way to the south side of Chicago? The collected documents in the bags that were retrieved, again, uh, from 8023 South Oglesby in South Shore, revealed that the home had belonged to Lee Provitiner, son of Sarah Hirschbein Provitiner, the sister of prominent Yiddish playwright and novelist Peretz Hirschbein, and, uh, and of her husband, it was also the house of her husband, Abraham Provitiner. Uh, Provitiner was himself an active Yiddish theater director, administrator of the Arbiter Ring schools, and playwright of dramas for children. The couple had moved out to Chicago in 1936 when he came to administer the Arbiter Ring School in Chicago. Peretz Hirschbein and Abraham Provitiner were either the author or the subject of most of the articles in the collection that was left in their house by their son, Lee Provitiner. It is impossible to determine exactly how the Stephanie manuscript ended up in Provitiner's home, but my two guesses, uh, my best guesses at this time are that the manuscript found maybe the copy that Sholem Aleichem originally sent to Adler in 1905 and perhaps later lent to Tomaszewski. Not used that manuscript somehow made its way to Peretz Hirschbein. Or it could have come to Peretz Hirschbein while he was still in Russia through Yankiv Spivakovsky or Sam Adler, the signatories to the contract, when Hirschbein was still in Odessa in the early 1900s because Hirschbein himself created the so-called Hirschbein Troop in 1909 and may have been gathering or looking at a variety of scripts for consideration. If there are any scholars in the audience who may be able to offer additional leads, either on the route that the manuscript took or especially on who could possibly have scored the songs that are taped into the manuscript, I would love to talk to you and I invite you to get in touch with us. In closing my own discussion of this history, I would like to return to the concept of a manuscript or a piece of material culture as a Jewish place, a site of memory, or also of forgetting, a potentially living site of transmission. For the past 15 years, I have led groups uh, in cooperation with the Taubi uh, Foundation for the uh, Renewal of Jewish Life in Poland, um, groups of students and educators through cities and former shtetls in Poland. And again, my ongoing work with re-emerging narratives of Poland's Jewish past has led me to reflect a great deal on the aura associated with place, with objects, and with traces. What is the power of a physical artifact, a piece of cultural heritage that suddenly unexpectedly reaches us from the distant past? More specifically, what is the special frisson of wonder that can be excited in us, even those willing opponents of essentialism and authenticity, by an authentic historical object? a kind of renegade piece of cultural history that makes its uncanny appearance outside the archive, outside the museum and the auction house, that emerges undocumented and unrecorded, crossing in our presence and through our own engagement with it, the boundaries that separate absence or forgetting from presence, illeg illegibility from legibility. When such an object does appear, what demands does it place on us? One modest request that the Stephanie manuscript makes is that we remember the songs and music of the Yiddish-speaking Jewish communities to whom Sholem Aleichem wanted to give the stage. Again, I'm delighted and honored to invite Yiddish singer, composer, cantor, and fellow archive lover, Sharon Bernstein, to bring some of these songs to life. All but 
one of the pieces that Sharon has prepared for today's performance appear in the 1905 manuscript in partial form, uh, as simple notation that required elaboration, or in some cases only as lyrics. Um, before uh, we take you through the pieces in the play, I wanted to ask Sharon to say a few words about her process of engaging with and developing these musical pieces. Hi, good afternoon. So, I'm first of all just incredibly grateful to Shana for making this match and um, for this chance to work on this match manuscript and with Karen, it's amazing. Uh, interacting with this manuscript and creating music for its songs has been fascinating. Of the 10 songs for which there are lyrics in the manuscript, there's music notation for four, only one of which, Tikanta Shabbos, is what we could call complete, with full text and musical phrasings written in. The rest required various levels of interpretation and arrangement, from putting in lyrics and chords, to in one case, writing some additional music for lyrics which didn't fit with the music written in the manuscript. Stylistically, both the text and the music from the songs are quite simple, somewhere in the realm of Hasidic song and simpler Yiddish folk songs. In composing music for the remaining six songs, I used as a stylistic guide the music that was included with the manuscript, as well as traditional chanting where it was indicated, such as Badchonis, and the mood and characters of the story. I am truly sorry not to know who is the composer whose work we are getting to enjoy today, but I am most grateful to them for this opportunity to interact through the pages of history with them and their work. Act one. Stempenu opens up as preparations are winding up for a wedding. We meet Stempenu and his klezmorum, Rachel and her friend Chaya Etel, and are introduced to a raucous mix of voices from the community. The two wedding parties, the racy klezmor lotion of the musicians, the young rascals who mess with the instruments, the curses of the klezmorum who try to drive them off, negotiations and admonitions from elder family members. In the third scene, Stempenu strikes up the fiddle, and even before the Bodkin climbs on the table to narrate the wedding, the women have begun to cry. Heiko Bodkin begins his rhymed wedding song, or Kalabavainen. Thank you. 
begins with a clear admonishment, not just to Rachel, but to all women, and indeed all those present. Life is bitter, but a Jew had better learn to accept her lot. One could be a lot worse off in hell. In a moment of comic relief, the wedding ceremony breaks down. The bridegroom refuses to appear, as his family has decided to hold out for two taluses rather than one. <laughs> After a scuffle, the deal is agreed on, and the wedding is complete. Bride and groom are led away while, quotes, outsteps a Litvak woman and begins a Kazakh, a Kazakh song, dance, singing while telling a tale in Litvish. The poor are inviting themselves to the wedding. Poverty, she sings, is a bad thing. Orm is nicht gut. But she reminds the wedding guests that they are all of the same flesh and blood. And in front of family, she won't be ashamed. The wedding guests join her in the chorus. song, and the Klezmers again allow the women at the party to take the lead. Kugel heistu, in oiven steistu, und in moilzegeistu. Kugel's your name and you're standing in the oven, but you're headed for my mouth. <laughs> magical plane. She insists that it's the music and not the man that has enchanted her. As she talks with her friend Haya Etel, the sound of his playing from the next room keeps her in an almost delirious dream state. Nu, no, how he plays. It's not a person playing, but the playing of angels. Rochel's more worldly friend Haya Etel warns her, and more than one person has fallen for Stempenu. Do you know what kind of demon lives in his fiddle? What kind of spell? People say that he caught the eye of a Polish count's daughter, and her father promised him three villages. What did he, what did he say, asked Rokola. He said that even if someone were to fill the house with gold coins, he wouldn't convert. What's important for you to know, Rokola, is that the Polish lady threw herself in the river. From the wedding in Act One, Sholem Alechem turns to Shabbos in Act Two. The action takes place some months later, during the lazy hours of Shabbos afternoon at the home of Rokola's in-laws, where she lives. In this act, the text and the music stress that while it is religious traditions that unite the community, and those traditions are beautiful, it is women who pay an often almost unbearable price for that continuity. A loner and a reader, Rachel sits apart from the family, reading from a Teich Chumash, or woman's Bible, the Tzenorena, also importantly, a Yiddish language text, and pondering her own situation and that of Jewish women. The reading is appropriately on Dina, 
She reads, quotes, and you will leave. Dina left the house of Leah. Shechem, son of Hamor, saw her. He took her by force and lay with her. As an aside, I'll mention that while in the 1925 version of the Tzanurimah uses the word gelegen here, here, Sholem Alechem actually uses the word gefeinik, which emphasizes violence. She reads on, weighing commentaries. The Baha'iya writes, thereby Jacob erred because he locked her in a box in order that Esau, Shechem, would not take her for a wife. Pausing as if, I'm still quoting from the text, pausing as if she is speaking to herself, locked in boxes, locked up in a coal bin. Haya Etel used to say, in the Midrash it is written, when the wife sits always in her home, she atones for the sins of her entire family like a sacrificial altar of the entire world. What sins? So you sit in your house and you don't even see the light of day? Since Haya Edel died, there isn't even anyone I can speak a word to. She starts to sing quietly under her breath. drawn to the window while her family snores away. It's stifling in here. What a light-filled day and not a single living soul in the street. As if this beautiful bright world were not here for their sake. As if the sun doesn't shine for their sake. What is it that's pulling at my heart? What do I keep yearning for? For my parents still after all this time? My parents have forgotten me. They did their duty. They married off a Jewish daughter. Baruch Shepetrani Man Shoshal Zeh, and blessed is the one who is rid of the responsibility of punishing me. She starts to sing again under her breath. startled to see a head poke in the window. It's stepping you. And he pours his heart out. I am in chains like you. Just like you, I struggle for the big world, for the free world. Rochala, I have a plan for you, for me, for us both. Promise me, give me your hand. Rochal manages to tear her, uh, herself away and close the window. And when she returns to her Tai Chumash, or woman's prayer book, her reading is dominated by thoughts of stepping you and his promise to take her away. This time she reads an alternate translation, quotes, and his soul cleaved to Dina, and he loved Dina. 
Shechem had won her over because her father Jacob had no domain over her. Here, Sholem Aleichem introduces the sound and the music of prayer. Back in the living room, those who were not at that morning's services ask Alik, the nephew with a good set of pipes, to sing the Tekanche Shabbos, just as the new Hazam had sung it. Why do I get the short straw, asked Alik. Who then, ask his brothers, us? We only know from Nigunim. Alik sings. Swedish sugar, asked Rachel's father-in-law, Rev Chaim ben Sion. Sweet as honey, agree the nephews. Oh yeah, says Rachel's husband, Moisha Menasha. While the women guests sit apart and exchange gossip and innuendo about Stephanie and Rachel, constantly repeating that one shouldn't speak Loshen Hora, her, father, her father-in-law asks Ali to sing something happy this time. The results are bittersweet at best, uh, but the audience joins in, and this tune is Vosmer Zainen. The audience joins in and helps him pick up the pace, snapping their fingers. In Act 3, 
we find Rachel trying to read aloud a letter from Stefanou, decoding his improvised spelling and awkward phrasings. My dearest angel from heaven, my kosher soul, nice spelling of kosher soul. <laughs> he speaks a bit better than he writes. She's repeatedly interrupted by her overbearing in-laws, whose suffocating attention is symbolized by a new necklace of coral beads they've bought her for, from Stempenew's wife. <laughs> Alone again in scene five, she tears off the beads, desperate with anger and desire for Stempenew. He writes that he loves me, such nerve, from a klezmer. I'll tear him to pieces. Only when I hear his playing, ah, oh, his playing, oi, his playing. He doesn't play, he sings, and the sweet nightingale accompanies him. It reminds me of those beautiful summer nights as a girl when I used to sit in the doorway and sing. play forever. Throughout the scene, Rachel can hear Stephanie playing as he, lead, as he leads the wedding party through the streets, and she realizes that he's playing especially for her, leading them near her house. Ve is mir, wind is mir, woe is me and woe is my sin. Rachel becomes desperate and climbs in bed, pulling the covers up. Who do I have to blame other than myself? I myself with my great, great sin. I must recite the Kriyas Shema. Nishiosko kivis ya doinai, kivis ya doinai, lishiosko, adonai, lishiosko kivis. Nishiosko kivis ya doinai, kivis ya doinai, lishiosko, adonai, lishiosko kivis. She falls asleep reciting the prayer, and the ghost of her friend Chai Edel appears to her. You are a Jewish daughter, a married woman, she tells her, and the sound of the wind off stage becomes a faint fiddle playing a version of the Yom Kippur prayer of repentance, Asham Ni. In act four, the play reaches its climax with a meeting between Stempenew and Rochel. He tries to embrace her and to convince her to ask for a get. He dreams of making it on the European stages, a Jewish Paganini. While Rochel, Rochel resists his advances, the ghost of Haya Etel appears to her once again, singing the Ashamni prayer. And this gives her the strength to flee from Stempenew, leaving him bereft. 
rather than with a death by either drowning or poison, uh, <laughs> with a return to humor, community, and the family kitchen at Stempenew's house. While Stempenew broods and dreams, Fredel, his wife, his mother-in-law, Tsepoira, Heikel Badkin, and the rest of the Chlesmorum exchange insults and perform a post-mortem on Stempenew's latest failed romantic episode. In terms of music, we could say that Act 5 offers a virtuosic verbal display of what was one of Sholem Aleichem's favorite genres in the musical repertoire of the Yiddish language, Yiddish proverbs and curses. Actually, one of the first books that young Sholem, uh, Sholem Aleichem compiled was a collection of his own stepmother's colorful curses. And that delight in the richness of the colloquial language comes out in Act 5. Like a jazzy back and forth volley between trumpet and clarinet, the Bodkin and Stempenew's mother-in-law parry proverbs and rhymes. This final scene I asked Yiddishist and humorist Michael Wex to translate for me for a presentation in Jerusalem, and I offer a bit of this brilliant translation to close out with. Here, Heikel the Bodkin leads off, bookending the play in a kind of corollary to the Kala Bevenen with which it had opened. Only this time, the Bodkin's rhyme is directed not at a young bride, but at Stempenew, who also has to bear his difficult lot in marriage. Mum's the word because everyone's heard. Stempenew's keeping his thoughts unsaid, starts Heikel Bodkin. He's frightened, his spouse should, he's frightened lest his spouse should punch him in the mouth or take a rolling pin and sock him in the chin. Shah, here comes his trophy wife. May she burn, be trampled, and have the plague end her life. <laughs> and just in case you're keeping score, she's brought her mom for one rhyme more. Close friends are like nettles, they grow without rain. Stempenew's mother-in-law, Tsepoira, and Heikel Bodkin. And Heiko Bodkin, a tongue has a long shofar, shofar, but it can't blow an ox. Where there's two on a cushion, number three best not push in. <laughs> the Klesmorum join in, taking Stempenew's side, but Tsepoya dominates. Salt in their eyes, stones in their hearts. Better a slap from a hothead than a kiss from a fool. If you've got bread, don't go craving candy. If you sleep with the cat, you'll get scratched and that's that. Blow your nose and rub it in your face. <laughs> Stempenew finally speaks up and asks his wife, Fredel, what do you want from me? What should I want, counters Fredel. What can a wife ask from her husband? Ox hide is all you can ask from an ox. <laughs> Fredel scolds him. All the married women that you've gone gaga for have taken off, but the woman you're married to is staying forever. Fear of the Lord comes and goes, but a boss is always a boss. <laughs> Stempenew stands up and tears at his hair, cursing at himself. Screw up, schlamazel, klezmer. He takes up his fiddle and gives the klezmorum a sign, taking the play out with a final tune. Grab your axes, boys.
Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to, to present to you.